When I was unemployed, I found myself staring at the wall a lot. Most of the time, it was my default position for considering life's big questions. How did I end up back in my parents' house? Where are all the jobs? And in this particular instance, why the fuck am I wearing a skinny tie? I had just gotten back from a faux date with a girlfriend. That's girl space friend, as in friend who is a girl. The laundry list of platonic tell-offs in my past has ranged from the gentle letdown and just not ready for that type of relationship to the pithily callous, you're sweet, but no. <laughs> my fake date of the evening knew me and knew I needed things spelled out, so she opted for the calm and matter-of-fact approach. I like you a lot. You're funny and smart, but you don't get anything going down here. <laughs> you don't need a line graph to see the trend. I stared at my skinny tie and patterned shirt and retro Converse sneakers and thought, why a skinny tie? Who was I trying to look like? A fat Doctor Who? Was I really trying to imitate the style of a centuries-old and entirely fictional Time Lord? I put so much effort into this fake date because I thought I had finally done things right, that it wouldn't end up on the friendship tip. But the sad truth was, given all my history with women, I expected to get rejected. Rejection was acceptable. One thing was clear, being me wasn't working. <laughs> I ditched my tie, my laptop donged as I powered it up, and just as I was considering Googling how to be Ryan Gosling, <laughs> I saw this email. Hi, Rory. This is Willa from Suicide Girls. We received your writing samples and we're hoping you'd like to join our official blog as a freelancer. Weeks earlier, I'd ended up on a vague corner of Tumblr and saw a post that said the Suicide Girls, the internet's one-stop shop for all manner of naked, tattooed ladies, needed writers for their blog. Even if I wouldn't get paid, I would have free access to the site which is basically like getting paid in boobs. <laughs> I emailed Willa immediately, but with one caveat. I was about to start earning my teaching credential and had to be very aware of what Google would turn up. My byline next to a picture of a topless goth chick would not engender support from any future employers. I asked her if I could use a pseudonym for all future Suicide Girls business. I chose the name Ed Farragut. My middle name is Edward, so that felt the least foreign. I wanted to keep my Irish roots, so while looking at a list of Celtic surnames, I saw Farragut, and it spoke to me. See, Farragut has the word gut in it, which would have been a point of ridicule for Ed in his younger years. That was my level of self-confidence at this point. I wouldn't even allow my fake name to be sexy. Willa emailed Ed with some guidelines like word count and deadlines and whatnot. Don't be afraid of pushing the boundaries, she wrote. Give us something that people will talk about. In writing, only danger is interesting. So give us something dangerous. Willa was the first real editor I had, a person who was interested in helping me craft something I wrote beyond just identifying the topic sentences and telling me when to use a semicolon. I treated each nugget of advice like it was a gift from writing Jesus. Plus, she had unwittingly given me amazing dating advice. Only danger is interesting. <laughs> I came out strong with my first blog post, 1,200 words on the secret genius of Jersey Shore, how it was art on a Warholian level, how it spoke to a generational shift in television, and how if you didn't get it, then you're probably a plebe. It got 13 comments, and while 13 comments may not seem like a lot, you have to remember that this was a website where sensitive alternative guys went to get their rocks off. So getting 13 of them to put both hands on the keyboard <laughs> and type a comment was considered a huge success.
Willa emailed me saying, yes, more like this. My new personality was born, had a name and an email address. Ed Farragut combined the wise ass of Joss Whedon, the smug self-importance of Aaron Sorkin, and the infallible pop culture acumen of Quentin Tarantino. He did not give the first fuck about anything. Turns out leading a double life was all about time management. From 7 to 3.30, I was Rory, a nice guy who wore sweater vests, listened to NPR, and was desperately trying to understand the pedagogical significance of Bloom's taxonomy. From 3.30 to 10, which was my bedtime, because even alter egos have shit to do, I was Ed. Keeping the two separate wasn't difficult. Until Ed and Rory met Christine. She was studying to be a math teacher, was trashily girl next door, which meant she regularly wore tight tank tops. One night after class, our educating adolescence professor invited everyone out for a drink. Christine and I were the only two that went. When she drove me back, we sat in her car in an empty Northridge parking lot, and I asked for her number. For studying and stuff, right? She asked. I could have said yes and kept on being the nice guy, but only danger is interesting. <laughs> no, I said, or maybe Ed said, I want to take you out on a date and then probably make out with you. I'm a really good kisser. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> Most of my brain was screaming, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Who was that guy? I wasn't used to being so aggressive, but she smiled. I have a boyfriend. This is where Rory would have said, oh, geez, I'm sorry. Well, I hope you have a good night, and I'll see you in class. But Ed looked her dead in the eyes, shrugged, and said, I don't care. <laughs> By the time I got home, Christine had friended me on Facebook and texted me twice. I felt good. I felt powerful. I felt like Ed. Being dangerous meant being selfish. Ed allowed the text to grow more and more suggestive, discouraging Christine from telling her boyfriend anything. Ed locked his lips with hers not a half hour after promising to try to be friends. When she eventually dumped her boyfriend, Ed was there for her under the dubious circumstances of support, which started with a supportive hug, transitioned to supportive making out, and finally supportive under the shirt groping. Ed never got laid, but that didn't, stop him, that didn't stop him from trying. Was it dangerous, mean, manipulative? Yes. But Ed didn't care. After all, when things went wrong, it was Rory who would take the hit. <laughs> Meanwhile, Suicide Girls users were starting to get Ed's shtick, had him pegged as a trolling malcontent. The latest post about being a poser, of all things, only got six comments. A few weeks after that, a post about YouTube vloggers only got two, and Willa openly admitted to putting up because they were lacking content that week. My carefully cultivated persona of aggressive douchebaggery was starting to slip. I had created Ed for attention. I thought I wanted attention, so I worked to court it. But the unfortunate truth about attention is it's not the same as what I actually wanted, to be liked. I was in the elevator to Christine's apartment wondering if I should go back to Snark in order to get my numbers back up when the door slid up, when the door slid open and a skinny guy in a Panera Bread apron got on as I got off. Christine took longer than normal to answer the door. I sat on her couch thinking she would join me. She did not. I got up to hug her. She pushed me away. A knock at the door. Panera Bread guy stood on the other side, still adjusting his apron. Hey, I forgot my visor. We get written up for that. Christine went to her bedroom. Through the door frame, I could see the bed was unmade. The pillows had two distinct impressions on them, and her underwear was on the floor. She handed him the visor, turned, and stared at me. Aren't we going to be late for class? Was all she needed to say. Her cold eyes made my balls shrivel up, and I saw for the first time how truly full of shit I was. Ed was a child's balloon, desperately expanded through willful bursts of carbon monoxide. 
He never had power or substance. Christine did, and now the balloon didn't, hadn't just stopped expanding. It sputtered out in a fart noise of draining self-confidence until it was nothing but limp rubber. Ed was dead. I wrote another post for Suicide Girls. It got one comment from my mom. <laughs> with Ed gone, it fell to Rory to deal with Christine. I didn't leave because I kept hoping, as all lonely men do, that things would change. I wanted to keep her attention because I wanted to be liked, and I still thought those two things were the same. Rory was the one who took her out to dinner while she worried about running into people she slept with. Rory had to hear about how all the guys she were dating were total losers. Rory was the one who sat on her bed like a lapdog as she meticulously updated her OkCupid profile pictures. Meanwhile, I blew two deadlines with suicide girls, and Willow was not happy. I ignored her emails and felt guilty. I used the site for furious, self-hating, downright Catholic masturbation <laughs> while simultaneously having vivid, non-sexual fantasies in which some suicide girl would message me because she dug a post and then we'd meet it up and hit it off and then, of course, I'd run into Christine and I'd get to pull one of those, oh, this is my girlfriend, she's a model. This is, um, I'm sorry, what was your name again? <laughs> After a while, though, I tried logging into the site and this message popped up. We're sorry, but this account has been suspended. If you would like to update your billing info, please click here. No blog posts, no free pierced tattooed boobies. Christine texted me, getting ready to watch a movie, want to come over? I wrote back yes, all the while replaying a delusional scene in which she would finally see me for what I was. Great, she wrote back. Can you pick up the movie and some popcorn and a thing of Sprite? And I did, because of course I did. When I got to her place, she was packing a suitcase. What's going on? I asked. She didn't turn around. Well, there's this guy in Montana. We've been Facebook messaging. He's a writer like you. I think it's a guy in Montana? Are you fucking kidding me? You don't look at me. I buy you fucking groceries, and now Montana? I dropped the food on her table and went to the door. She stopped me with a hand on my shoulder. I'd done it. Ed was back. She would apologize, and we'd kiss, and then... What? I'd forgive her? Forgive her for treating me like some kind of weird sprite summoner? Were we supposed to date? That's a great how we met story. Oh, she made me feel like a shit bean for a couple of months, and I'm still pretty subservient and live in constant fear she'll dump me for a dude who can make a decent tomato basil soup. <laughs> I didn't even know what I wanted from her. I just knew I wanted my balls again. Look, she said, I do like you, but right now, you're my backup plan. Like I said earlier, I need things spelled out for me. <laughs> and this was it. Christine's balloon didn't just pop, it fucking exploded, and I finally saw the insane narcissism that had motivated her every move the past few months. And with that, Ed returned. Ed should have said some great last line, something witty and hurtful, even a solid, fuck you. But the only real response was, so, yeah. I'm done. When I got home, I emailed Willa an official apology, thanked her for the opportunity, cited personal reasons for parting ways. Ed had served his purpose. I hoped Rory could stand on his own two feet now. Spring 2011 and the second semester was approaching, which meant Christine and I wouldn't have a class together. I purged all digital traces of her, deleted her number, blocked her on Facebook, even changed my username on words with friends. A month later, she realized I was out of the game, and I got a message that said, You unfriended me? Nice. I didn't respond because there was nothing left to say. I cleared the chat history. I did that. Not Ed. Me. Thank you. That was Rory Kelly, everybody.